Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, second session of our virtual seminars organized by the International Society for the Study of Early New England. Uh, my name is Thais Porak. I'm the current president of the society, and uh, we're organizing these virtual seminars to showcase all of the exciting research that's going on in our field uh, from different disciplines, ranging from art history to linguistics and everything in between. Uh, and today we're very honored and very happy to welcome our uh, second speaker, who is Yuta Uchigawa, uh, a part time lecturer at Rikyo University. Uh, he's currently um, preparing his PhD thesis that's hopefully completed next year, uh, but he's already got a number of uh, very exciting publications about celestial signs in the Anglo Saxon Chronicle, uh, and he also wrote an article titled. Uh, core and periphery in Anglo-Saxon England, the Mercian Assemblies in the Kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons and the Formation of the English Kingdom, uh, which won Utah the uh, ICM 2021 award for best article by an early career researcher. Uh, and today he's going to share um, some of the insights that we can find in that article uh, with us today. So we're very happy that, uh, that he's here, very excited to hear what he has to say. And so uh, Utah, without further ado, uh, the digital floor is yours, uh, so you can share your screen if you want to, um, and please tell us more about core and periphery in Anglo-Saxon England. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation to the seminar. I'm very honored to be here as a speaker, so and uh, I, this talk will be a very condensed version of my article with the same title. So if you are interested in it in the detail, so please read it. Uh, you can download it from the link. Yeah, let's begin. So uh, uh, England was uh, gradually formed in the 9th and 10th centuries by the Western Sun Kings. Uh, after the invasion of the Vikings began in the late 8th century, King Edbelft of Wessex took control of other Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in the southeast from Mercia. After succeeding in repulsing the Vikings, Edgebelf's grandson, Alfred, created the kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons by forging a firm connection with the Marcians themselves. He entrusted the remnant of Marcia to a certain elder man called Ethelred, Lord of the Marcians. His kingdom was expanded by his son, Edward the Elder, and his daughter, Ethelfled, Lady of the Marcians, who was married to Elderman Ethelred, uh, so that it incorporated all the land south of the Humber. Uh, in 927, uh, his grandson, Ethelstan, conquered Northumbria and became the first king of the English. The English kingdom eventually consolidated in the reign of Edward, great-grandson of Alfred. Uh, Ethelstan and his successors from time to time also claimed the overlordship upon the other British rulers and designated themselves as the king or emperor of all Britain or Albion. This process of the formation of the English kingdom can be regarded as the process of creating the system of core and periphery in Britain. In this view, Wessex and land south of the Thames served as the core, land between the Thames and Humber, and what used to be Northumbria as the same periphery, periphery and other British polities, such as Welsh kingdoms and kingdom of the Scots at the periphery. In this process, the kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons was of particular interest as a completely new polity, which integrated two peoples under King Alfred against the common threat of the Vikings. In this polity, the Marcians were regarded as an integral part of Alfred's kingdom, and Ethelred and Ethelfled operated from the start under Edward's overall control, according to Simon Keynes. The, details, the detail of its governance, however, has not attracted much attention yet due to the scarcity of sources. Although it is well known that Ethelred and Ethelfled held it as autonomous rulers since West Saxon kings rarely traveled beyond the Thames, a little study has been done on the aspect of their rule. Uh, however, it can be approached by focusing on assemblies and charters and notifications which were issued there and which recorded them. 
<clears throat> like in other polities in the early medieval Europe, the assembly in Anglo-Saxon England functioned as an effective and central device which enabled the rulers to govern the realms, often lacking regional administrative units and centralized bureaucratic structure. All kinds of matters took place, were discussed with councillors and settled with their consent. From the reign of Esterstan, the main and virtually only arena in which core semi-periphery and periphery gathered and interacted with each other were the assemblies convened by the kings of the English. For the English kings, assemblies at the same time contributed to a growing sense of unity among peoples within England, according to, according to Levi Roach, and were intended to stimulate new subjects to tie the periphery more closely to the royal court, according to John Maddicott. And therefore, assemblies of the English functioned to make the relation between the core and the periphery visible and st strengthen it. As such, assemblies have drawn much attention, especially since 2000. Most of the works on the, on the assemblies, however, focus on those of Esterstan onwards. Consequently, it is unclear how the structure which embodied core and periphery appeared. Thus, it is worth examining the period just before the birth of the kingdom of the English and the role played by assemblies in it in order to have a better understanding of the structure, which would last for centuries and have a not insignificant influence even to present day Britain in the form of the par parliament. Before Esterstan, in the period of the, the Kingdom of Anglo-Saxons, assemblies worked in a completely different way. Uh, there was not only not one assembly of the Anglo-Saxons, but two separate assemblies for the West Saxons and the Martians, respectively. Since the West Saxon assemblies had been intensively examined, I focus on the Martian assemblies in the period of the Kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons by using charters and notifications issued at them and narrative sources which mention them and attempt to show the role they had to the formation of the English kingdom and thus of the creation of the core and the periphery in England or Britain. Firstly, various aspects of the Martian assemblies, that is, places, times, attendance, and the business are examined, then the the intervention to Martian assemblies by the West Saxon kings is discussed. And concerning sources, and we will use charters in a narrow sense, that is, title deeds of lands and privileges, and notifications which record dispute settlements. Since they were made on the occasion of assemblies, they were prime importance to understand them. Where they are not available, Narrative sources can supply additional information. In terms of assemblies, the witness list incorporated into charters has significance. The attendance of the assemblies and their hierarchy can be reconstructed by it. And they were comprised of secular and ecclesiastical elites listed in order of each rank. 33 documents related to the Martian assemblies are known. Existing documents concentrate in, concentrate in the reign of Esteret and only two remain from Esteret's time. Narrative sources which record events from this period are the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the Martian Register, which is incorporated in the manuscript B, C, and D of the Chronicle, and the life of King Alfred by Asa. Let's begin with Esteret's assemblies. He was able to convene them just as his predecessors did, did. He was able to decide what should be done both in religious and secular affairs and settle disputes with aid and consent of his magnates. The marked difference from previous ones was that he did almost all of these under the permission of King Alfred. Still, the king seemed absent in most cases. Esteret and his counselors even acted without any reference to Alfred. At times, however, his influence was more visible. As a whole, the Martian assemblies were autonomous but not independent from the West Saxon kingship. Bearing this in mind, we will look at places, times, attendance, and business of the assemblies in turn and reveal the way how it functioned for the governance of the region. 
we have seven Martian assemblies place, uh, Martian assembly places. I look at figure one. Uh, the three places fall within the bishopric of Worcester was the ancient kingdom of Fuiche. And this region could be his power base. They were also situated near the Welsh border along with Shrewsbury and possibly Weldbooth, uh, probably intended as a check against the Welsh and the Vikings. This distribu distribution sharply dif differs from the former pattern. In the kingdom of the Marcians, they used to be two areas where assemblies took place frequently, the Trent Valley and the Lower Thames Valley. The former had been the political center of the Marcians and the latter the economic center of Britain and where church councils used to be held. The shift reflects the consequences of the takeover of the eastern part of the kingdom by the Vikings. When we look at the West Saxon assemblies during that period, they were confined to the south of the Thames. The only assembly jointly convened by the West Saxons and the Marcians, which can be located, took place in Chelsea, which was situated on the border of two peoples. In Anglo-Saxon England, assemblies were held in any time of the year, but often at church festivals. However, this tendency is not confirmed in the kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons. Besides, assemblies were held intermittently in the period, and there were intervals of several years. It differs from assemblies before and after the period, which took place regularly. The general scarcity and the irregularity of assemblies in this period can be ascribed to the intense warfare against the Vikings. The Marcian witnesses were designated as the counselors or literary wise men of the Marcians. Uh, when assemblies were convened jointly, the West Saxon counselors and their Marcian counterparts were distinguished. Apart from those appeared in the joint assemblies, there was no Marcian layman who attested in the West Saxon charters. Marcian bishops were occasionally found in the West Saxon charters since they had to attend the church councils of the province of Canterbury, which was under the West Saxon control. Generally speaking, there were two distinct assemblies with different participants in the kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons. The scale of the attendance is also of interest. The attendance of Ethelred's and Ethelfred's assemblies were 25 at most and 15 on average. Uh, please see the table one. Uh, this is half in size compared to the former assemblies of the Marcians. However, it exceeded the, the average of attendance in Alfred's assemblies and on a par with that in Edward's. On the other hand, assemblies of Esselstyn and his successors were larger in size and usually have 25 to 40 witnesses. Again, the decrease in the size of assemblies in the kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons was the sign of crisis caused by the Vikings. The most powerful and frequent in appearance among witnesses were bishops and aldermen. Some of them survived the change of regime. Other, other characteristics concerning the attendance of the Marcian assemblies was the frequent attestations of queens, no involvement of priests, and fewer appearance of thanes compared to the West Saxon assemblies. The Marcian queens had significant political power compared to the West Saxon counterparts. In regard to priests and saints, we must consider the difference in the structure of two polities. In Wessex, there was a sort of bureaucratic administration. Eldermen were appointed by the king as the head of each shire, and the chaplain and saints were at their courts to serve as office holders. On the other hand, Mafia remained the federation of tribal kingdoms and provinces. The king was primus inter pares, and Edelman were leaders of local peoples. With this difference, it was more convenient for the West Saxon kings to leave the government governing governance of the Marcians to its own assemblies presided by Ethelred and Ethelfred. Since we outline the Marcian assemblies in the kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons, we will proceed to examine the business handled there. The majority of Ethelred charters deal with grant of lands and privileges. In addition, the lease of lands, the reissue of charters, and dispute settlements are also recorded. Uh, 
One of Esther Fred's charter is concerned with the grant of land and the other with the grant of permission to acquire land. All charters issued with Alfred grant lands and privileges, and those with Edward order reissuing of lost charters. These are all related to Mercia in some way. In other words, the West Saxon kings were not able to make a decision concerning Mercia without the presence of the Mercians, while the latter did not involve with things not related to Mercia. There was a clear distinction between the activities of the two assemblies. The fact that from time to, from time, to time, Esterred and Esterfred were capable of granting land and privileges, which usually belongs to kingship, without permission of Alfred and Edward, means their quasi-regal power within their realm. The fate of the Mercian assemblies after Edward's take aura, take lover of Mercia was unknown to us because no charter remained from this period. He did not seem to be welcomed by everyone. A revolt occurred in Chester and some Mercians took part in it. Instead, it seems more plausible that the governance of Mercia was entrusted to Esterston. Though the eldest son of Edward, he seems to be excluded from the succession because he because of his illegitimacy. According to w William of Malmesbury, he was sent to the court of Esther Red and Esther Fred and brought up there. His closeness to the Marcian people was illustrated after the death of Edward. Councillors of the Mar Marcians elected not Elfweald, another son of Edward, who was chosen by the West Saxons, but Esselstan. In doing so, the Marcians proved to be able to act on their own initiative in such a momentous event as royal succession. For Esterstan's part, he acted as the king of the Marcians, at least in the first years of his reign. In one of his charters issued in 925, he gave land in Derbyshire to his thane Erdrich with the consent of the Marcian bishops and abbots. The beneficiary seems to be the same person who was granted permission to acquire land in Esterfred's charter. When the king gave his sister to Sistrick Yoke in the same year, the, the event took place in Tamworth, the former political center of the Marcian kings. From these two instances, it would be safe to say that the Marcian assemblies continued to function under the control of King Esterstan as the successor of Esterred and Esterfred rather than as the king of the Anglo-Saxons. So far, we stressed the autonomous rule of the Marcians with its own assemblies. This is by no means to say that the West Saxon kings lacked power or will to intervene in the Marcian affairs. Their intervention took various forms. Firstly, joint assemblies of the West Saxons and the Marcians will be examined, the others were observed in the Marcian assemblies in which the West Saxon kings and their courts happened to be present. One would think that joint assemblies of the West Saxons and the Marcians are, were direct antecedents of assemblies of the English after Esselstyn. However, they were quite different in some respects. Firstly, uh, there was a disproportion of the ratio of the two people in the witness list. In terms of bishops, the Martian bishops were always present, while the West Saxon counterparts were absent from some occasions and always fewer when they attended. Moreover, different roles were expected to counselors of each people. In the three chapters issued by Edward, Esteret, and Esterfred at the same assembly, the beneficiary asked only for the three rulers and the counselors of the Martians to re realize the lost chapters. The West Saxons were also there, but just as witnesses. Marcian affairs could be treated in joint, joint assemblies, but the decisive role was played by the Marcians. The West Saxon kings chose to intervene in this most direct way when both territorial ambition and kinship and patronage to the Marcian elites were involved. For example, one of Edward's four charters was concerned with land near Oxford, it was originally granted by King Brugret of Marcia and his wife Esther Swiss. For Edward, Esther Swiss was his paternal aunt. Please see, uh, please look at figure three. Uh, 
and the Oxford area was intensely con contested between Wessex and Mercia. It must be noted that when Ethelred died in 911, Edward received London and Oxford and all the lands which pertained to them. The church, county, the church councils also provide the two people with an opportunity to gather together. The West Saxon kings exercised their power over the Mass and bishops, who were suffragans of the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was in turn subordinate to the king since 838. In the case of a meeting where the partition of the West Saxon sees was decided, along with the newly created bishops, a bishop of Dorchester was also consecrated. This again reflects the interest Edward had in the Oxford area. For bishops' part, on the other hand, who were by nature oriented toward the Church of the English beyond political rivalries of the kingdoms, they acted as harbinger of the integ integration of the West Saxons and the Marcians by attending church councils. The intervention by the West Saxon kingship was felt not only in joint, joint assemblies, but also in the Marcian assemblies themselves. The first type of the intervention is making permission, confirmation and consent, as well as witnessing. Three charters fall within this category. In one of them, Ethelred, with Alfred's consent and witness, exempted Barclay Abbey from a tribute to Alfred in exchange for land and money. He leased the land to the third party afterwards in the same charter, but there was no involvement of the king in this transaction. A king's intervention was done as long as his rights were concerned. The second is just making permission, confirmation, and consent. Two charters record this kind of intervention. In the charter of Bishop Welfels of Worcester, he lists land pertaining to the bishopric, bishopric to Cunehelm, his kinsman, with the permission of King Alfred and of Ethelred and Ethelfred. The fact that two clergies were acquaintances of the king probably was the mot motivation of royal in involvement. Please note that this kind of intervention could happen without their presence by means of messengers or letters. The last is witnessing only. One document records the former agreement between Bishop Welfels of Worcester and Elderman Esterwolf concerning land belonging to the Church of Winchcombe with attestation of Alfred and Esterred. Both parties had close connections to the king. Welfels as a partner in his education reform and Esther Wolf as brother-in-law. It is likely that they sought Alfred as an arbitrator who had every reason to avoid dispute between his friends and family. In short, the latter two types of intervention were made when parties concerned were tied to the king by kinship or patronage. Unlike these instances examined so far, locatable assemblies of the Marcians from which the kings of the West Saxons were absent, and land and privileges concerned there were all situated within Marcia, and most of them were far away from Wessex. Moreover, parties concerned except Bishop Welfels and Elderman Ethelwolf had no known relationship to the kings. There was no need for the kings to intervene in these kinds of affairs and probably had no power to do so. They entrusted these to the assemblies of convened by Ethelred and Ethelfred. From this and all the discussion made so far arises the matter of authority over Marcia. It is unwelled in Old English and the, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle referred to or implies it more than once. London had been under Ethelred's authority since 886 when Alfred entrusted it to him until 911 when he died and Edward took control of it with Oxford and lands pertaining to them. This means land north of the Thames, except those under Scandinavian control, belonged to Ethelred until his death. This is supported by legislation, legislation evidence. One of Ethelred's law codes uh, legislated at the, the assembly of Gretry seems to have been based on Edward's law code issued before the mid 910s. One of the clauses states 
there should be arm unit, uh, one coinage in King's arm weld or area of authority. This matches the coin production, uh, coin production south of the Thames with uniform design, weight, and fineness, while quite different types were minted in Western Marcia. Edward's authority had not reached Marcia yet. After annexation of London and Oxford areas, however, Edward seems to have taken more expansionist policy against Marcia. At the same time as his well-recorded military campaigns towards, towards Danish territory, he apparently mobilized armies of Gloucester and Hereford to make the raiding army promise to leave his own world in 914. On the other hand, Ethelfred was absent from the core region of her power, that is, the province of Fritje, after her husband's death, which must have been followed by his funeral and burial in Gloucester. She might have lost the area to Edward by 914, and he moved to reclaim Tamworth in 913. Sorry. And her move to reclaim Tamworth in 913 and her subsequent campaigns in northwestern Mafia might have been a re reaction to her brother's aggress aggression. If this is the case, Esther Fred transferred her core to the north, while Edward merged the southernmost periphery into his core. The natural consequences of this must be more frequent assemblies in her new dominion, of which very few are known due to the lack of archives from Litchfield or Hereford. Although absence of evidence might be simply evidence of absence of her assemblies, just as her brothers, or a result of the devastation caused by the Scandinavians, it is equally possible that it resulted from Damnatio Memoriae by the West Saxons. She was mentioned in the main text of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, only one in 918, on her death as Edward's sister with no title. In Marcian register, however, she died in the eighth year in the eighth year that she held control of Marcia with rightful lordship. Also, her daughter Elfwyn was deprived of all control in Marcia and was led into Wessex three weeks before Christmas. Even after Edward got rid of the mother and the daughter and acquired the authority over Marcia, he suffered a rebellion in his last year by the Marcians. Edward's attempt to reorganize the core periphery structure between Wessex and Marcia proved to be premature, and the inactivity of assemblies on both sides of the Thames in the later years of his, his reign would be caused by the tension between the siblings as well as by the Vikings. The task was left to his son Esterstan, whom the councillors of the Marcians chose, their, chose as their king. In the kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons, the formative period of the core periphery structure of Wessex and Marcia, the Marcian assemblies functioned as an autonomous but an if effective governance system for the West Saxon kingship, which lacked the means of direct control of Marcia. At the same time, Marcian, Marcian assemblies served as a medium through which the West Saxon kingship permeated Marcia by selective interventions and gradually absorbed both Marcian elites and lands into Wessex. However, the assembly itself was not a place to visualize the structure and strengthen it. Indeed, Ethelfred's assembly showed a centrifugal tendency with its northwards shift and no interference of the West Saxons after, the, after her brother's attempt to bring Marcia under his direct control. Rather, church councils fulfilled the role to some extent. They attracted Marcian churchmen to the core of Wessex. When we look further afield, what was to become the semi-periphery and periphery of Britain, such as the Welsh kingdoms and the Viking kingdom of York, were initially subjected to the Marcian and the ritual of submission took place in the Marcian assembly. Although Edward took over this overlordship, it re remained superficial and fragile. The person who truly inherited, inherited all of this was Ethelstan, who was reared by Ethelred and Ethelfled, probably started his career as deputy of his father in Marcia, 
and then became the king of the Marthians. With him, the core moved to Marcia temporarily. After his takeover of the whole kingdom, the Marcians rushed into Wessex, crossing the Thames. Under Esselstyn, formerly distinct assemblies of the West Saxons and the Marcians merged into the assemblies of the English and acquired a totally different role to tighten the existing ties between the West Saxons and the Marcians and to integrate new peoples from peripheral region. In this sense, Esselstyn is a key figure to transform the assemblies into the arena, which embodies the structure of core semi-periphery and periphery in early medieval Britain. Thank you very much.